meeting is being recorded and I am also using otter.ai to automatically transcribe our notes from the session that I will be sharing with everyone here in the group today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Ashley Coffey. I am the Emerging Technologies Lead at the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technologies, also known as PEAT. And I'm also the co-lead of the Business Case XR Workstream. And I have my lovely co-lead here with me today, Ms. Madalena Crosti. Maddie, would you like to take a moment to introduce yourself? Maddie, of course I think you're I muted. Will <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. Hi, everyone. My name is Maddie. I'm a white woman with um, brown hair. I have been working with Ashley for the past six months or so on the business cases for inclusive XR workstream project, which was a research project about um, access accessibility within workplace tools. Not sure if you caught the panel earlier today, but th that's what we were discussing. Yes, and um, for those that weren't able to make that panel this, mor uh, this morning, that's quite all right. Everything that's happening over the course of these two days of the symposium is being recorded and it will be shared uh, with everyone within about a week after it's edited. So have no fear. But to kind of set the tone for our deep dive discussion today, we're going to talk about the business case for inclusive XR and the value that inclusively designed XR workplace tools have in this new realm of hybrid work. Um, we all know that the pandemic has rapidly shifted how we work with one another. We're no longer always going into the office. Um, hybrid work is now here to stay, and XR tools are being used for training, upskilling, socializing, and just communicating in meaningful ways and sharing information. And it's important that it must be accessible by design, and we want developers of these technologies to consider accessibility from the start of an early stage of the product's development. So we're going to take you through kind of the impetus for this project and opportunities for you to contribute to this meaningful work within XR Access. Before we also dive in, I want to take a moment to um, let everyone know that XR Access is a volunteer run initiative. If you're interested in volunteering and contributing to our mission of making emerging technologies accessible to all, um, visit our website at xraccess.org. Um, if you are a company out there that would like to support our work financially, we have different membership levels for companies to contribute to, both small, large, private, public, nonprofit. Um, so consider supporting our work because without your support, we can't continue to do this meaningful work and show the value of inclusively designed XR tools. So xraccess.org is the website. Um, since you registered for the symposium, you all will be signed up for the newsletter and will receive monthly newsletters with webinars, events, and additional opportunities to continue this conversation beyond just today. And I wanna thank everyone for choosing this deep dive. And I want to also say that um, for accessibility purposes, we are not using the chat box in Zoom. Uh, it presented some challenges with the screen readers that we were testing with. So we will be using the Q&A Slack channel um, for questions. There are two different Slack channels here. There's the general Q&A that's for general XR access symposium questions. And then additionally, there is a specific Slack channel for our deep dive session. And that is going to be, I will verbalize it. It starts with the, the hashtag, of course, 
a deep dive dash B as in boy to dash meetings. If you're unfamiliar with Slack, the communication tool that we're using, if you're using a desktop version, uh, you'll be able to navigate to a plus sign on the left-hand side of the screen that will allow you to add channels. If you're in the browser version, it'll be on your, your left-hand side of your screen as well. So if you have questions, feel free to drop them into the chat. And we also have the live captions link um, in there as well. So before we get started, I wanna take a moment to just go around the room and hear some thoughts from everyone that is in the deep dive session today. We also have some of our incredible business case XR researchers here with us today. And we also have some incredible guests in the audience who are members, advisory members of our project. So um, I would like to go ahead and open the floor. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like to share who you are, where you're from, and what got you interested in this particular deep dive session. I, I would love to kind of um, brainstorm with you all what you came here to learn so we can make sure that you get the most out of today. And it looks like we have um, Rakan has their hand raised. Rakan, would you like to um, either go off uh, mute or go off camera or both, whatever is comfortable to you? Oh, I think we lost Rakan. Oh no, okay. That's quite all right. Um, mm -hmm. We also have, it looks like Meryl Evans is with us. She's also one of our incredible business case core researchers and has contributed so much valuable knowledge to our team through her research. Um, it looks like we do have a hand raised. I'm sorry, I don't have a name here, but I will, I will address you as iPhone. iPhone, would you like to um, introduce yourself? I'm assuming it's probably me. My name's Kevin. Um, what caught my interest about this uh, session is um, just kind of as a screen reader user and kind of the accessibility uh, professional in kind of the 2D desktop space and just kind of finding that after things moved on to like virtual meetings um, using things like Zoom and WebEx and Teams and stuff like that made it much more accessible and just um, wanted to just kind of be involved and have an understanding of what this new kind of VR immersive, um, how, to, how does that work in terms of um, kind of accessibility and screen reader. Great, great. Thank you, I'm Kevin. I'm so glad that you're here. And uh, thank you for, for joining in on this discussion. And I want to also let everyone know that part of our discussion today is also going to be around the PEAT XR and hybrid work toolkit. This is a very comprehensive toolkit that you can find on peatworks.org. That is P-E-A-T-W-O-R-K-S dot org. And within this toolkit, um, you can learn how you can help employers or your own employer understand the value of using accessible extended reality technologies and hybrid work environments. And after reading and consuming the content of the toolkit, you can better understand how to procure accessible XR technologies for your workplace or organization. And you'll also learn how to use these types of technologies in ways that in include all employees equally. For example, um, Accenture, who gave the keynote yesterday, uh, showed a great example of how they're utilizing XR to onboard new employees. They've deployed over 60,000 headsets uh, globally uh, to their workforce of 700,000. And just in the past, I believe, year, they've onboarded over 150,000 uh, new employees in virtual reality using Altspace VR. And within 
alt space, they have a digital model of their Accenture offices. And what they've done is basically taken a very boring manual of onboarding. I think we've all been there. Those like really big, big books of like the fine print. Um, they've disseminated that into immersive content that's really meaningful, engaging, interactive, and fun. So um, without further ado, uh, let's go ahead and continue going around the room. And I will share the link to the Pete XR and Hybrid Work Toolkit in our breakout Slack, as well as any additional information that would be relevant to our conversation today. And I believe someone also had their hand up. I'm sorry if I missed you. Would you mind raising your hands again, please? Yeah, I had my hand up. So my oh, name is fabulous. Pipe Dada, them up. And I'm a research intern, REU intern at the University or Gallaudet University. And me and my group are currently doing a research project on XR captioning and the immersiveness that captioning can give people both deaf hearing and hard of hearing. And um, I just, I'm joining this, this call today just to learn a little bit more about immersiveness in meetings and collaboration specifically. And I feel like that could help my, my ventures in this project. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that you're in the deep dive Slack channel so that you can see the resources that we'll be discussing today. Yeah, I am, thank you. Great. Um, I will be sharing also additional resources like the W3C Immersive Captions Group. Um, Marilyn and I are a part of that. I highly recommend taking a look at that. That might be useful as well as some of our PE resources and equal entry as well. You've come to the right deep dive session Thank you. Uh, to talk about this. Yeah, Meryl is amazing um, um, in this area and, and, and can definitely share some incredible insights. Great. Thank you. Hi, this is Mel. Thank you for that nice introduction, Ashley. I'm sorry it was a little slow. I had a little um, technical problem, but it's stop now. Anyway, Pranav, I'm very excited to hear that you're working on captioning. And I actually mentioned there is an immersive captioning group at W3. Did you say you were at Gallaudet? Yeah, I am. Okay, so are you familiar with Roger? Yeah. Yeah, he's okay, my program so, director. So you're probably familiar with all that. And I would think he shared that document with you. Um, it's in the Slack channel, but okay. I will put it here just to make sure you have it. And I also have been working on um, with equal entry, as Ashley mentioned. I, there's a few articles on there about captioning in XR environments. And that would be at equal entry dot com slash blog. Um, and if those are X, A, A, R, V, R, it's, it's so hard to communicate here without the chat box. But I know and I understand because we want it to be accessible for everyone. But that's my biggest challenge because I can't share the link. And anyway, so um, I think I've answered all your questions. Actually, so it's in the Slack, just to repeat that? The articles are in the Slack? I'll, I'll put it on the Slack channel. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to give it back to Ashley. Perfect. Um, Dawson, Franz just joined. He's my partner in this whole project. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else that would like to share how they found out about this deep dive session and some takeaways from today? Otherwise, I will go ahead and kick off some um, some topics for us to discuss. I think Mahfoud, you have, you had your hand up potentially, maybe. I see you just unmuted yourself. Oh, um, Stephanie has her hand up as well. So maybe Stephanie, you can go first and Mahfoud, um, if you want to go next. Oh, sorry. Now it's okay? 
Yes, we can hear you. No, oh, okay, sorry. <clears throat> no, I was saying that I'm totally blind and uh, I'm an accent, accent employee. Uh, so part of the, of the project, but uh, yes, at the moment, I'm just starting to understand how the metaverse work and uh, understanding their feasibility impact for metaverse. So we are working on how can make the, the metaverse or at least part of it accessible for people with disability. But I'm yet to start since so I'm an uh, uh, accessibility consultant working there, leading testing teams. And uh, yes, we are now starting to work on the metaverse and let's check how it how it work and how accessible can be can be done. Thank you so much. I'm glad that you're here. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to, to let us know as we kind of continue and go throughout this discussion. Stephanie, would you like to take a moment to have the floor? Sure. Hi, Ashley. And I'm going to follow Ashley Lee and say I'm a white woman with uh, now white hair and a uh, black blouse. Um, and I work with XR Association. We've been really pleased to work with the XR Access Group on Workforce. We are focused on the responsible development of XR and in the enterprise space specifically. And so this is one of the areas we work on um, and, are, and are working to make meeting spaces and hybrid meeting spaces accessible to uh, specifically working on a task for people with low vision, but just writ large helping to get the message out to enterprise that this is a valuable tool they need to use for all kinds of things, including learning and development. Um, and we're here in DC, so we could always, um, it'd be nice to get together with you, um, Dawson and, um, and Pranav, because we're right here and you're right here. Okay, thanks. Thank you so much. And uh, Stephanie, I'm so glad that you're here. I'm going to share some resources from XR Association that are relevant to this discussion. And also, uh, would you like to let everyone know about the October 1 event happening in Atlanta? Oh yeah, our Limitless Future Conference, right? Yeah. I think it's, I think it's November. I have to November. Today. Sorry, November. <laughs> that's, that's what threw me. I'm like, I don't think it's October. Um, yeah, so we are doing our second annual conference on a learning and development called the Limitless Future in Atlanta. And what we do there is we invite partnering with uh, um, the Jobs for the Future community, which is an HR community out of Atlanta. We bring people who are in human resources to meet with XR people to, to share with them the value of bringing XR, which Accenture in their keynote, as Ashley mentioned, already knows very well, but to help them to understand how they can use this technology and also with a focus on um, DEI and A to help them know how they can use it for a broader cross-section of their uh, employees and staff. So we're very excited about that. Happy to be doing the second year. Last year, we had to go virtual. This year, we're fingers crossed in person. We'll see how it goes down in Atlanta. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you, Stephanie. And I also believe we have Liz Hyman with us. Maybe she left. Um, but uh, if you're here, Liz, and we're so glad that you're here, um, it's it's so great to have everyone in this, this community come together to try to make XR a bit more accessible. I believe there's a statistic that I um, saw yesterday that the metaverse is going to be a $12 trillion economy by 2025. That's not too far off, which demonstrates how quickly XR is going to scale, which is why the work that we're all collectively contributing to is so important. And now more than ever, it's important to make sure that accessibility is included 
in the beginning of a project life cycle. If you've been listening to the discussions today, you've probably heard things like make sure that you bake in time during your project management cycle, your project development cycle to address accessibility and bake it into all aspects of your design. I um, was following one of the discussions happening in Slack earlier, and there was an analogy that, that someone um, made a refinement to that I love. I usually try to use this analogy when I'm describing the importance of baking accessibility into the beginning of a project. And it would be when you're building a house and you build a foundation, you wouldn't want to go back in and completely change your foundation, right? It would be expensive. It would be time consuming. Um, and someone changed that to the rewiring. You wouldn't go, you wouldn't want to go in and rewire your house after you've built it. So that's kind of a good analogy that I like to use to help people understand why it's important. And also at some point in our, our lives, we will all experience a disability, a uh, permanent, temporary, situational, and it's important that we design for all and design for our future selves as well. There's some incredible work out there being done by organizations. Um, equal Entry, as Meryl mentioned, XR Association, the W3C community, and these are all resources that we'll be linking into the Slack channel as well. And we encourage you to extend this conversation beyond just these two days so that you're able to stay connected to this community. But let's shift the conversation over a bit to talk about uh, inclusive, immersive meetings and collaboration. And I want to start with a little bit of a story time to set the tone. And I think Meryl will know where I'm going with this here. So there was a time that Meryl and I were in an immersive platform uh, that will not be named at this time. And we were uh, floating around with our avatars, checking out the space. Um, there's no captions in this immersive environment. So we were trying to hack it as the cool kids call it by importing a stream text link into the immersive environment most immersive environments for training and collaboration have the ability to open up a browser which can actually be used for good for things like captions great example of a curb cut effect so using that stream text link could have been a great solution, but unfortunately it wasn't working. And unfortunately, this immersive platform charges $10 per month around for captions. And the captions don't capture $25. $25, thank yep. you, wow. Wow, $25 for an accessibility feature. and. It's, it's mind blowing to me that no one said, hey, we shouldn't be charging for this. So um, to land this plane, Meryl and I were trying to figure out how are we going to communicate with one another here. And there wasn't a chat box. There were no captions. So Meryl accepted this design challenge and pulled out a virtual sticky note. And Meryl, would you like to share what happened next? Sure, thank you, Ashley. I forgot that the squad messed up audio, so I'm going to make up for that. So I have my hair down audio, but now it's pulled back. I pull it here, I have glasses on, and I have a progress of a perfection short, which I didn't mention audio. So Ashley and I, oh my goodness, I was so shocked. There was no shot box. And I tell you, I feel handcuffed when I'm not run and it's proving to be a challenge right now because we don't have a chat box. Anyway, so I actually said we shouldn't be hacking our way around, but for now, this is what we can do. So they had a sticky note. And the cool thing, how I'll, I'll give the platform credit. The sticky note, you can either type on it or use your voice to do speech to text. So Two ways you can um, document, you can create a sticky note. And I was very happy to see that. That's progress of the perfection, right? So 
we just kept posting sticky notes after we kept erasing them when I was writing, wrote another one. And we used that for links as well. So, oh, the other thing we forgot to mention, Ashley, is that when you add caption to your account, it captions yourself. Mm -hmm. It doesn't caption mm -hmm. other people. And I'm like, mm. I don't, I know what I'm saying. I need to know mm -hmm. what other people are saying. And it was charged on a per person basis. So um, we talked to the company and they are full aware. And I want you all to know the company's not trying to be rude or negative about it. The reason they do it is because they have to pay the company for that artificial intelligence that creates the caption. So I understand that for, from a business perspective, they want to be able to cover that cost. But unfortunately, it's accessibility, and we don't want to charge extra for accessibility. Thank you, Meryl. That's so true. This is Ashley. And I appreciate you sharing that because there's two things that come to mind here with this example. One, had inclusive user testing been implemented in the rollout of the captions, someone would have caught it or should have caught that it's not beneficial to read your own captions. You know what you're saying. It's been like, that's just kind of a, so that's a good example of inclusive design being baked in. And also I wanted to let everyone know that the captions that Meryl mentioned are running on Microsoft Azure. Microsoft Azure, that's why um, the cost was there. Meryl, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add, um, but there's a meal. The captions were also very hard to see in that platform. It was almost, it was very transparent and the front itself was white. So it was white on a very glassy colored light gray. And it, I kept having to look around the room for something dark to give that contrast. So it's very important that caption have a background color to help break out that contract. Thank you, Meryl. And to tie this to some of our business case work stream research content, out of the seven immersive platforms that we all researched, only three of them had caption capabilities. And while we say progress over perfection, right? Um, there's still a lot of work to be done because if you look at the sampling of immersive platforms for collaboration and meetings, that's a very small percentage. And as Meryl mentioned, they're, they're not perfect. There's another immersive platform that also has captions um, running off of Microsoft Azure, and they do live language translation support for Spanish and Portuguese, which is great, but there are a few problems with that because the text is white and there's no background for contrast control. So if you're looking around and let's say the text is covering someone else's avatar, it can be difficult to read. Additionally, if there are more than 30 people in the virtual environment, there's going to be, there's going, they're, they're going to crash. The captions are going to crash. Um, Meryl, it looks like you wanted to say something. Yes, um, the example you just gave, Dr. Meryl, the example you gave of how of the white, I have pictures in my article on intro entry, and I'm working to add those links into the Slack for Pranav. Uh. So if you like to see the screenshots, the videos of these platforms with their captions, I'll have the link in the Slack channel to look for them. Damn. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Meryl. And another thing that I want to bring to everyone's attention, and while I'm speaking, I will find this and put it in the Slack channel. Um, but this happened, I believe, last month. There um, was a case that ended up getting won by a user who is blind. It was a lawsuit against HP, I believe. Um, I need to fact check this, but just to make sure um, it's correct. But they won because there were no captions um, in the immersive environment. And that is going to set a precedent 
for a lot of other immersive environments as well. Um, if anyone is familiar with Section 508 or WCAG, um, there's a lot of things to catch up on when it comes to XR and there's no direct alignment of this is how things should be. There's a W3C standards organization, which is a great group, um, but it's hard to translate some Section 508 into XR. But and, and of course, the law in the United States is also catching up with accessibility issues that are perpetuated from two dimensional digital spaces into three dimensional worlds. So we really wanna make sure that those inequities and that exclusion is not perpetuated into, into XR. And I'll pause there because it looks like we have Sushil um, has their hand up. Sushil? Hey, good afternoon. Um, name is Sushil, I work for Verizon. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yes. And uh, just wanted to, uh, you know, listening to this conversation, I'm new to the VR space, uh, but I work uh, on the accessibility team here at Verizon, especially looking at learning and development uh, experiences, uh, trainings for employees, um, and especially uh, thinking of, you know, how we have uh, closed caption options on uh, YouTube experience or Vimeo, where there is a toggle for closed captions. Um, is there a possibility where on VR like Oculus or other platforms, if, you know, almost like the player itself having something like a, a closed caption toggle um, that is built in, you know, that may be the first step, uh, just like what YouTube did, did is, you know, they had that functionality there, but after a few years, uh, there was automation added where if you upload a video, it would automatically add closed captioning. So along the same lines, I'm thinking if VR can have the same uh, capability, maybe, you know, in the future. Thank you so much, Sushil. I appreciate you mentioning that. So in my experience talking with Meta, Google, Microsoft, I will say that that's a discussion point. It's easier said than done. There are some talks to implement a system-wide caption toggle on Oculus, I don't know when that's going to be rolled out um, completely. And also something to consider is the processing power of some of the head mounted displays. Um, are they being processed locally on the device or are they integrating into a web uh, internet interface, being able to access internet? Um, so the captioning toggle would be great if it was like a system wide. And, but that is really limited on the hardware or the manufacturers of these head mounted displays that are building the software that goes in them. Like Meta, for example, that has complete control over the hardware design and the physical software design. Um, there are some immersive experiences that do have maybe a, um, a switch for captions, but it's very, very, very minimal. Um, I'll pause there for a moment. Sure. Uh, thanks for your response there. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking also way ahead where <clears throat> in the case, <clears throat> if, they, uh, if they add this functionality in future, um, also if those captions can be exposed, again, there's no screen reader built on uh, these devices, but if there is in future a built-in screen reader that can happen and uh, if these captions also can be exposed uh, to the screen reader, uh, that will be again another win. So I'm just thinking ahead. Yes, <laughs> yes, Sushil, I'm really glad that you mentioned that. Two, two thoughts here. One, 
if that would make a great hackathon project. So if there are any students or developers who are on the call that would like to do a hackathon project, I think that's fabulous because what, what a world it would be if there was the possibility to automatically export into an SRT format the live captions into a screen reader um, in real time. Um, we're not there yet. We're, we're unfortunately far, far away. However, I will say there are some capabilities, um, not capabilities, there is some great research being done by Thomas Logan of Equal Entry. He is working on the accessibility object model research project to try to make the structure and design of an immersive environment, like for example, Mozilla Hubs, screen reader compatible. So for example, if you were to enter into an environment, instead of it saying structure on the left, structure on the right, polygon up here, polygon down there, it would thoughtfully say you've entered a classroom and mm -hmm. there's a chair to your left and Stephanie's avatar is standing to your right, waving her hand. So the accessibility object model project is fantastic. And um, if Stephanie Montgomery would like to share a few additional um, nuggets of knowledge on the accessibility object model project, I'd love for her to take the floor. Absolutely. And I know that, um, Shuli, you were there. You were on the, the breakout session this last round. So he got to see the whole demo. Oh, from, wonderful. From, um, Thomas Logan, which is an amazing demo. Um, but we are working even beyond what Thomas was doing to really think about the prioritization. What do you need to know if you have low vision or are blind coming into a VR environment? When do you need to know it, right? What needs to be around you? And so with XR Access and the members of XRA, we're exploring what it takes to, to bring this to life and to build a prototype and then to test it with, because nothing about us without us, right? So we wanna make sure that we are testing it and we know that whatever it is, the solution is, it's gonna be a, a feature set. I mean, we heard today in our earlier breakout session, not to leave the story, but we heard about audio cues and how there are tons of games out there with fully functioning audio cues. My, my suspicion is that that works for some, but not all. It maybe works for most, but still not all. So you might still need other other things. And um, and so just an audio cue might not be enough. And in the enterprise set, setting, you might need different things than you need in a gaming session when you're in a massive multiplayer shooting zombies, right? So all those things we're working on and thinking about and trying to do that all now, because this technology is really, even though it's been around for a long time, it's still very nascent in its stage in development. And we all want to, from the manufacturer's perspective and developer's perspective, make sure that we can build these things in from the beginning, right? So that's where we stand and that's why we keep having these conversations. So we'd love to have you, you know, get engaged with XR Access with us to, to help make this, make this happen. And Verizon should be there too. A lot of this data is going over that network, right? So. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, um... My focus is uh, in my current role is specifically for uh, get towards uh, learning and education. Uh, you know, and many of the companies that build these experiences, uh, there's a wow factor to it. So a person when uh, that does not have disabilities uh, takes a look at these experiences, there's a, this wow factor, you know, this is amazing. But, uh, you know, providing that same experience to a user with disabilities. Uh, you know, there's no standardization there, you know, there, there's no, uh, we cannot hold accountable any, uh, you know, developers or any uh, vendors that do these, develop these trainings. So I hope you, you know, we can, you know, come up with similar VCAC standards for the VR space where, you know, uh, it will be good for, you know, for everyone. Really one of our, our overarching goals is to be able to work with the, you know, developers, platforms and manufacturers to like eventually, and this is years, get to tool sets that are plug and play on the Unity platform, the Unreal Engine, you know, in the in the Android and any other design platform so that it's it is baked in, as Ashley was saying, 
although she didn't use her best analogy. I love your cupcake analogy. I still think that's the best, Ashley. If you oh put my the gosh. Last, it's not really a cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for reminding me of that. So this is Ashley. I am so thrilled. I feel like so much has happened in the XR and accessibility world in the past few months, which, which is really exciting, which it also presents us with a reminder to take a breath and soak in the amazing work that's being done now and use it as inspiration to advocate for continuous change. So the analogy that Stephanie mentioned here is think about an a cupcake you you get this delicious cupcake i'll say it's chocolate because i love chocolate you're about to bite into it and then all of a sudden the chef comes over and he's like oh wait i forgot to put the egg in it so let me crack this egg and put it on that cupcake you're not going to want to eat that cupcake anymore right no way i am not here for salmonella <laughs> uh so <laughs> bake bake the egg in or if you don't eat eggs then bake the egg replacement in at the beginning and um yeah yeah just remember that if you're trying to encourage someone to build inclusive design just tell them about the cupcake and i think that will be a good way to to um extrapolate that information <laughs> love it <laughs> it um that the mail, that the, con the conversation came up in Slack today. And I've actually mentioned it is more expensive to add accessibility after the fact. But, and somebody was asking, is it worth adding accessibility when you've already made the product? And I say, absolutely, yeah. Because you will be able to get those user facts that weren't there in the first place because they was not accessible. And yet it costs more to add up data, but it will pay off in the long run. I just looked up data and people with disabilities, their family, their friends, their supporters have 13 trillion, trillion with a T worth of disposable income. You don't want to miss out on these people. Thank you, Meryl. Um, yeah, I want to remind everyone that 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 value that ROI, I don't think businesses realize how much revenue they're missing out on when they don't consider inclusive design. And uh, to share a bit of an anecdote, um, Meryl and I presented at the Augmented World Expo conference in California last week on the value of inclusive design. And as someone who is his, is able bodied and is in a community of speakers who are also able bodied, it was incredible and so profoundly powerful for Meryl to be there and share her lived experience of why it's important to bake captions in and to bake in accessibility. And I want to encourage you all to be advocates and champions for people with lived experience within your organizations and within your networks. Um, that's how we are able to build more inclusively designed products is by having those diverse experiences and diverse backgrounds at the table to design. And there was something that came up at AWE as well. Um, Meryl, I'd love for you to explain it and because you explain it very well. I, I, I love the notion of nothing about us without us. But can you shift that a little bit and tell us about the nothing without us? Dr. Mel, thank you for bringing that up. I heard, uh, I think Stephanie mentioned that earlier, not long ago. And I have been trying to educate people to think nothing without us, period. Not about us, forget that. Nothing without us, because that means you have people with disabilities working with you every day. So in your organization, you hire them for their talent and their creativity. People with disabilities are some of the most loyal people you'll ever have with lower absentee rates. And of course, they have to be qualified for the job. I'm not saying go grab the first person you know off the street and bring them into your company, of course. But when you have people with disabilities in your company, you have an internal brain trust. People you can ask every day 
how to do it, um, would you try there? So when you have multiple people like that, you're gonna create some amazing product because you're not having to rely on people without those disabilities. Guess you don't wanna make assumptions because I can't tell you how many times people assume I know sign language because I was born there. And the reality is I don't. And that's not a good thing or a bad thing. It just is. And so I'm constantly telling people that because those assumptions are the ones that be expensive and they're not going to always be right. Thank you. Thank you, Meryl. I, I'm so glad that you shared that. And uh, I'd like to also let everyone know that I'm sharing a resource in Slack as well. Uh, it's the PEAT Guide for Inclusive Immersive Meetings. Um, and while I'm doing that, I want to shift the conversation a little bit to, to Maddie. So Maddie is amazing. And during the research process, she interviewed our core team members with lived experiences and gain some really interesting insight from those interviews. So Maddie, I'd love for you to share a bit of your uh, takeaways from the interviews that you facilitated and conducted within our team. Sure, definitely. Thanks, Ashley. I also see that, um, Sushil, you have your hand up. So maybe um i can share something and then if you wanted if you wanted to say anything <laughs> afterwards but um just just you know meryl i just wanted to say as well that what you just said is so powerful and so obvious but also so like i don't know you need a reminder like that um and i recently just uh, spoke to someone actually who kind of did this research project and used this methodology where they they basically had technologists but with people with disabilities and with creators kind of all working together from the very beginning on a project and then kind of, and then they sort of you know realized what the list of features they needed to the, and all the problems that they needed to solve so it, just that methodology I thought was very powerful um and so in terms of the what I did for the research project, um, I interviewed um, people, a, a variety of people with different disabilities and with different levels of um, and with different kind of uh, levels of experience with XR, um, which was really fascinating. And I mean, it was interesting, especially to hear, you know, the people with, I guess, less experience had you know they could see so much potential in it in in sort of what it could do for them what what it meant um what the potential of this technology meant um but they also found it you know frustrating that they weren't able to access it at the at that exact moment but they see that extreme potential i think you know there were for example like i interviewed um, Stuart, who was on our panel, um, speaking about limited mobility, so he's not able to um, like use his fingers, for example. So it was interesting to hear sort of like his design ideas around. Okay, but then why can't you just like turn your wrist to do something, or um, yeah, or you you know let's implement eye tracking more. That's really important. Um, so and and then I think Ma something that Meryl said, which I really found uh, like so again, like an obvious but very striking thing is like the thing that needs to happen in meetings and communicate at meetings and these kinds of tools is people need to be able to communicate with each other and all people have different ways of communicating with each other, which is so true. So that's kind of like. So, um, you know, in, in, in an interesting way to look at it um, and very powerful. And then also with um, looking at sort of people who were blind and or had low vision, um, speaking about, yeah, this accessibility object model, it seems like really fascinating project that is kind of um, 
the the next step in sort of helping um especially with screen readers because i mean most um like most platforms that we looked at don't support screen readers um except for mozilla hubs which does um and that's because you know it's also like an open source um platform so it, uh, so i think you know it would be amazing what the equal entry group did um, in terms of creating this world where, that could be accessible through screen readers and that had um, and that use accessibility object models within the different objects in the space, which meant like putting kind of metadata within those objects um, and allowing allowing you to move through the space through um, sort of um, through like. Uh, like the chat box and and kind of keyboard commands. Um, Meryl, sorry if I'm saying this, <laughs> if I'm not explaining it properly, please correct me. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I think, and then something that I did say at the, um, at, at the, um, oh, I, did, I said it, yes, thank you, Meryl. <laughs> um, yeah, something that I said at the talk earlier today, which was really, um, worrying I think in an interview that I did do was with somebody who um, has a lot a lot of experience with XR is an early adopter has been in it you know in it since 10 for years and years and and sort of because of all the issues with accessing that technology had kind of stopped using it or like uses it so much less you know um, so that was something that really shook me a bit um, and made me realize the urgency of how much we need to act fast <laughs> to fix this. But at the same time today or yesterday at the symposium, I was really encouraged because, you know, there were th that announcement from Mike from Meta saying that they're putting in money to um, to help research, um, especially uh, low vision and uh, like especially making XR accessible for for people with low vision was really encouraging, as well as looking at all the um, Accenture products that are coming out. I think that was really encouraging, but I think we need more and faster. <laughs> I like that. I think that should be the, um, the theme for kind of the next iteration of what our business case work stream is, is we need more accessibility and faster. Um, and more diverse experience and more diverse yes. um, designers, product designers, developers at the table. And there are a lot of really great resources out there. Um, the ones that we're mentioning, we are linking in the Slack channel, uh, xraccess.org, uh, peteworks.org, XR Association, um, Equal Entry, as well these are all fantastic organizations to uh, sign up for the newsletters and be a part of the of the initiative and if you are a developer or not a developer and this is okay um github there is a github repository called xr accessibility it's spelled out xr accessibility no spaces and if you star or subscribe to this repository it is a living, breathing resource of accessibility resources, guides, code snippets, and community members who are contributing to making XR more accessible. I will share the GitHub repository link in the Slack channel if anyone is interested in contributing to that discussion. So I see that uh, Mafood, you have your hand up. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. No, no, it's good. Uh, uh, one question: Do you feel that maybe I don't know the guideline double um, the web content accessibility guideline version three point zero? I don't know when they are coming. Oh. Uh, do you think that they can 
in court more to the companies and organizations to implement the XR accessibility. I know that now there are user requirements uh, in, in the devel uh, guidelines, but uh, I don't know how XR uh, uh, guidelines can be included in the web content accessibility guideline. 3.0. Do you think that when they when they are deployed, do you think that they are going to in, encourage the companies to accelerate the implementation and the accessibility for XR and for the metaverse? And then I have a second question. Sorry, do you know any person who's already working? Uh, thanks to the metaverse, a person with disability, of course. If you, I don't know if you know any case who's living thanks to the metaverse, having a disability. So finding the metaverse as an opportunity for employment. Thank you so much for asking those questions. There's a lot to answer here, so I will start with your first question. If I'm understanding correctly, you're asking, when will WCAG, the Web Accessibility Guidelines 3.0, be published? That is the burning question in the community, and unfortunately, there is no release date. Um, there are people that say it could be a couple of years before WCAG 3.0 is released um, so i recommend uh, subscribing to the w3.org newsletter to see when 3.0 will be released sherry burn haber who is an amazing accessibility advocate she actually published a uh, opinion commentary piece on the latest uh, draft of wcag 3.0 and I will share that in the Slack group for everyone to look at. It's very insightful. And um, Mafood, I would recommend reading it to get the best understanding of where that process is. Sherry Burton Haber does a really good job explaining it. Um, but it looks like, Meryl, you were going to say something. Did I spark a thought? So, Dr. Meryl, yeah, I wanted to point out that. The current we can um, run accessibility guideline version is 2.1. So those are 2.2 that work that's supposed to come out this year. So and it took a few years for this to happen. So when actually talking about 3.0, I mean we are talking probably more than three years, unfortunately. And I'm very excited about 3.0 because of the plain language that I will have, but unfortunately, we're gonna to have to be patient for a little longer. I just posted a project in, in the chat um, that might be of interest. It's not exactly like, um, not sure if it, it kind of um, is in the kind of working space, but it's blind to burners, which is a project that was that is, I would consider it kind of a metaverse project built in alt space. And um, the creators really attempted to create a, um, a world that would be accessible to the non, uh, to like the visually impaired people. But I think they, they were able to um, like um, allow um, people to, see the actual art or not see but like have the actual artwork that was this that was shown in this world um through screen readers but i think they're still working on like the login page for alt space and making that available to screen readers um but that's like something to, i think they're continuing to work on it they're part of our uh, they're part of xr access um, might be interested if anyone is interested to connect with uh, Chris Hainsworth to talk to him about that project. It's definitely an interesting one. This is Ashley. Maddie, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. And I want to let everyone know that we will be re reconvening back into the main room quite soon. 
uh, I think it's about eight minutes away. So I want to encourage everyone to share your LinkedIn URLs or, or contact information if you if you wish and the Slack uh, group. That way we can all stay in touch. Um, otherwise, the transcript um, will be added to the deep dive document and the recordings from the deep dive sessions and all of the presentations from today and yesterday will be made available um, within a week or so after they're edited. So feel free to share with your colleagues, your friends, your organizations to advocate for accessibility because it starts with us. It starts with us. Every single person has the opportunity to impact change. Um, you have influence. So utilize that in your organizations to make sure that XR tools are built with accessibility and inclusion in mind. Maddie, as we wrap up our delightful conversation today, um, I'd love to hear what your your thoughts are as we wrap up um, our our projects and our discussion. And what are you excited for for the future of accessible XR? Wow. Well, <laughs> I think from a personal perspective. Um, I've learned so much from this project, um, things that I probably, you know, yes, there were the technical aspects of, you know, the kind of accessibility features that you need to consider and all of that, but I think also sort of those, um, those kind of design considerations, uh, human considerations that Meryl like described today as well of like just surrounding yourself with um, people um, from different backgrounds, et cetera, when you're creating something. Um, and I think what I'm particularly excited about is taking that forward within my work um, from a personal point of view. Um, I work with a lot of creators um, through the various innovation programs that I run. So, um, you know, I think that's like a, ma a massive asset that I'm bringing with me. Um, I think that the hardware and software companies still need to like do a lot of work though to help us out you know because I think um which is why like I was I was so happy to hear about like the meta announcement but I but I do feel like um there's still there's still a lot more to be done there and that's like one thing that uh in in the sense like these companies really need to invest in accessibility a lot and um, I just, I think what I'm also excited about is seeing how much XR access has grown throughout, from the, throughout the past four years. And it really encourages me as well, because it means that, you know, these companies are starting to like really, you know, be part of this journey. They're starting to invest money into it, but I think still more is needed. And um, so the impetus of this symposium and everything has been really good um, and encouraging, I think. so. I guess, yeah, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Maddie. This is Ashley. And I want to just share with everyone, it's just been truly just an honor to be able to, to work with so many great people in XR Access Initiative. And I hope that you all can um, take some of what you've learned today and yesterday and and leverage it to make sure that technology is born accessible and it's wild like as as maddie mentioned the xr access initiative is just four years young uh, i remember mm -hmm. attending the first xr access symposium at cornell tech in new york city in 2019 and at that time it was good energy and the oculus go was out and there was some promise the hololens one was out the magic leap one was out but there wasn't a lot of accessibility so to see that that was 2019 and look where we are this is 2022 and how many iterations have we've gone through uh, we have the first 
consumer friendly price point head mounted display with the Oculus Quest 2 at 299 US American dollars compared to in 2018 you need at least $2500 to get a great PC that is powerful enough to sustain a head mounted display that's tethered a tethered headset so that is the rapid acceleration of how fast technology is moving and will continue to move. That's the beauty of technology is that it's constantly changing and there's always something new to learn, which is just one of my favorite things. Um, but thank you all for being here and being a part of the XR Access Symposium. I hope you all are able to join us next year as we celebrate the five year anniversary of the XR Access Initiative. Woo, yes. And uh, again, if you didn't hear it earlier, I um, would love to invite everyone to um, invite their organizations and their companies to become members. Uh, XR Access is a 100% volunteer run initiative. And it's because of amazing volunteers like all of you that are part of the XR Access core team and the XR Access research team that were able to move the needle forward and put these principles into practice, which is the theme of our symposium. So uh, thank you all. I hope you're able to put your principles into practice. And I believe we will be um, moving back into the main room momentarily. While we're waiting, feel free to drop your LinkedIn URLs in the Slack channel, in the deep dive, or if you would rather verbalize it, that's uh, perfectly fine too. Um, but thank you all, and I hope you all have a fantastic rest of your day, and thank you for supporting the XR Access Initiative. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Ashley. Um, it's been, yeah, great, great conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.